Chapter 17 It was late summer in South Africa. More than a month had gone by since Martine had first met Jimmy, and in that time her life had changed beyond imagining. Not that it had all been easy. After her flight from the secret valley, nine agonizing days had passed before she caught so much as a glimpse of the white giraffe, and then it had been so dark and the vision of him so fleeting that she sensed he was there rather than saw him. Naturally, her grandmother had chosen that very evening to embark on her all-night session with the game reserve accounts, and there was absolutely no chance of Martine sneaking out undetected. She just had to sit in her room and fume. By the tenth day, she was ready to tear her hair out. It didn't help that ever since the incident at the Botanical Gardens, the Five Star Gang had tormented her. They put chocolate on her chair so that when she stood up she had a brown sticky mess all over her uniform. It happened at 9 a.m., which meant Martine had to spend the rest of the day being snickered at by the whole school. She found Umthakathi and Witch scrawled all over her books, and on another occasion she opened her pencil case to find a hairy baboon spider, an African tarantula, lurking inside. Martine screamed so loudly that Miss Faulkner immediately banned her from speaking for the rest of the day. Not that that was very difficult. After what had happened at Kirstenbosch, a few children talked to Martine anyway. The five-star gang had turned them against her, and Ben, to whom she would have liked to speak, remained a mystery. When he passed her on the way to class, his mouth curled up at the edges as if he was happy to see her, but he never spoke. Even after he rescued her, he hadn't said a word, and at recess he no longer sat under the far tree in the playing fields, but took himself away to some unknown location. All these things conspired to make Martine feel tearful and lonely again, even though she was getting along much better with her grandmother. With the white giraffe gone, the emptiness she'd felt after losing her mum and dad returned. What if Jimmy was caught in a snare? What if he, too, was gone forever? Oh, why hadn't she spent any time trying to teach him some sort of signal so that she could call him? She scoured the books in her bedroom and in the school library for more information on giraffes, hoping to learn something that might help her. But the only new fact she came across was that the Romans had called the giraffe camelopardalus, meaning camel marked like a leopard, which was interesting, but of no use at all. Then, out of the blue, she had a brainstorm. It happened when she came across a book on dogs on her bookshelf. In his youth, her grandfather had apparently been a very fine dog trainer, and there was a jade box on top of the cabinet in the living room containing three of his old dog whistles. In a rare moment of sharing, her grandmother had told her that one of the whistles was completely silent to the human ear, because it was pitched at a frequency that only dogs could hear. But what if giraffes could hear it too? That night, Martine crept out to the garden and experimented with the silent whistle. For nearly an hour, she blew and blew, but nothing happened. Martine stood shivering and frustrated under the mango trees, convinced that she'd never see Jimmy again. Then, a miracle. The white giraffe came striding out of the darkness and stood beside the skeleton tree. Martine did a double take. She'd imagined seeing him again so many times that she wondered for a second if she'd conjured him up. But he was real. Not only that, he was looking right at her, just as he had done on the night of the storm. Martine didn't even pause to check for lions or leopards. She just went tearing through the game park gate and running and stumbling along the water hole track, sending all manner of night creatures fleeing for their lives. When she reached the giraffe, he lowered his head and she flung her arms around his neck with such enthusiasm that he snorted with alarm and backed off a little, even though he was obviously just as pleased to see her. Jimmy, said Martine, thank you for coming back to me. In her fantasies, she'd always followed this moment by hopping on the white giraffe's back and being whisked away to the secret valley. But in real life, Jimmy was an untamed animal as tall as your average tree, and Martine knew as much about training wildlife as she did about riding a unicycle on a high wire at a circus, 
so there were one or two practicalities to overcome. She found, for instance, that there was really was such a thing as beginner's luck. The first time she rode Jimmy, he stood quietly beside a tree and allowed her to climb onto his back, but this concept seemed to have vanished from his mind entirely. Now, when she attempted it, Jimmy waited until she was suspended between the tree and his back before spying some juicy acacia leaves and moving away. Martine had to improvise a sort of flying dive and latch on to his neck. There she dangled until her arms nearly came out of their sockets. At that point, she tumbled the very long way to the ground. Jimmy didn't understand what he'd done, but he made his low musical fluttering sound and nuzzled her with his silver nose until Martine forgot about the pain in her backside and remembered how much she adored him. I have to be patient, she told herself. She also tried to put herself in his position. If she were a giraffe and someone rubbed the back of her forelegs and tugged gently on her knees, she figured that eventually she'd understand that they wanted her to lie down. So she experimented with Jimmy, and, after some trial and error, he did. And before the night was over, Martine was flying through the moonlight again on the back of a young giraffe. That was only the start of it, though, because she then had to learn to steer Jimmy and stop him. It didn't happen overnight, and there were several close calls over the next few weeks while they got to know each other. Once the giraffe shied away from a bristling porcupine, and Martine was nearly impaled on its black and white spines, but through it all Jimmy was gentle and loving, and when he did grasp what she was trying to teach him, he grasped it completely, and it was as if he'd always known it. For Martine, it was then that the door opened on the real Africa, the hidden Africa, the Africa that few human beings apart from the Bushmen ever witnessed. Those nights with Jimmy were the most magical of Martine's life. It was rare for the other animals to notice her, and those that did seemed to accept her as an extension of the white giraffe. Safe on Jimmy's high back, she was able to watch baby warthogs play and moved close enough to elephants to touch their parched, grooved skin. Once, when Jimmy was drinking from a lake as black as ink, she found herself just yards from a party of bubble-blowing hippos. With their tubby bodies, piggy eyes, and tiny ears, hippos were among the cutest creatures in the wild, but they were also among the most lethal. Their huge pink jaws could bite boats as well as people in half, and frequently did. So Martine took special care to stay still and respectful whenever she was anywhere near them. But her favorite thing was to ride the white giraffe up the escarpment where she and Tende had had breakfast, swivel around so she could use his withers as a pillow and his hindquarters as a footrest, lie back, and gaze at the canopy of stars. So clear and cold were the nights, with summer sliding into autumn, that she was able to see the Southern Cross and Orion's Belt and even Mars glowing red in the navy blue sky. Sometimes she talked to Jimmy about what had happened to her, about the night of the fire and how scared and heartbroken she'd been, about her mum and dad and how much she missed them, about school and her struggles to fit in, about the Egyptian goose and the kudu and the strangeness of her gift. Jimmy's ears flicked back and forth, and he made his musical fluttering sound, and somehow she felt that in his giraffe way he understood everything, and she felt comforted. The whistle, it turned out, worked perfectly. Jimmy always responded to it if he could hear it, although how long it took depended on where he was in the reserve. Martine took to wearing the whistle around her neck, even at school, because it made her feel close to Jimmy. It also meant that she didn't have to hunt for it when she went sneaking out to see him late at night. But as much as she missed him, she was very careful to vary the hours when she called him and never do it more than twice a week. She was well aware that each time she went into the reserve, she was taking a risk. Still, she continued to get away with it, and she managed to persuade herself, mainly because she wanted more than anything for it to be true, that she and Jimmy could go on like this forever.